For those who are in our Bible class, you will have some background to this sermon as we've been talking about for some time, the Christian ethic. That is how God expects us as members of the church to live. I call it the converted life because we live a different kind of life. We have a different kind of attitude when it comes to how the world thinks. God has chosen to make all men one in Christ. Everybody that becomes a Christian hears the same gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And the church is commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16.15. Thus, when we're faithful to the truth of God regarding the church's teaching, then we all teach the same thing when it comes to what one's obligated to do to become a Christian and when it comes to the obligations of being faithful in the Lord's church. Today I simply pose the question, and I say I know some of you haven't been in the class, but this is designed to stand on its own as well as back up and build upon some things we've been talking about in class question simply is this, is racism sinful? Is racism sinful? Let me point this out that I've said several times before. I'll be repeating myself. When it comes to what God says in the Bible, the only race he ever speaks of is the race of man. He speaks of human beings. Last week in the sermon, I noted in Acts 17, Paul's speaking on Mars Hill in Athens to a bunch of pagans and idolaters who didn't know the God of the Bible, certainly didn't know Christ, didn't understand the gospel. They were simply not Christians, not converted. He made it clear that God hath made of one blood all the people of the earth. And so you'll never find the Bible talking about race the way we use it today. It'll talk about nations and countries and peoples, but it won't talk about it the way we use it today. So we have to ask the question before we get very far into this, uh, what's the meaning of racism? And I hope before this sermon is finished, we shall see that different people have different ideas about the meaning of racism or what it means to be a racist as those terms are employed today, keep in mind what I've said about such in usage in the New Testament. We have long, as the Lord's church, declared that we must speak as the oracles of God, as the inspired Peter instructed us to do. Speak where the Bible speaks, be silent where the Bible is silent call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. Now, as far as unity is concerned, when it comes to morals and when it comes to religion, we must do as that scripture that is imprinted above my head says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, to all in the name of the Lord Jesus, give me thanks to God the Father by him. Thus, we seek Bible authority for why we believe what we believe, why we do what we do. And we ought to, when it comes then to what is prevalent in the land, in the world for that matter, when it comes to what commonly is called race or racism. So I want to begin by defining our terms. I want to pause here and say concerning any study, if people want to discuss with you anything, you define your terms to them so they'll know what you're talking about, and you make sure they define their terms to you. You will find that a great amount of discussion can never get anywhere but in a state of confusion unless people know the meaning of the terms they use. And when we believe in speaking, as the Bible teaches, as the oracles of God, then we have to explain part of our teaching as Christians 
what we mean by things. So I want to begin our study by defining racism. Seeing that you don't find that brought out in the sense it's used today in the New Testament in the same way. Webster's Dictionary defines racism as, and I quote, the belief in the superiority or dominance of one race over another. Well, the Bible teaches that there are many ethnicities or nations. But, and I'm reiterating here what I've said in our class and then what I've said in other sermons, there's only one genetic race known as mankind. When Eve was named by Adam, she was named Eve because she was the mother of all living. Genesis 3 and verse 20. Now the all is significant. A-L-L. It's significant. I've often said this and those who have heard me teach have realized I say don't run over little words. They will have a lot to do with helping you understand, especially in the study of God's will for your life in the words of the Bible. So do not neglect the word all, that Eve was the mother of all living. What does that mean? What are the implications of it? It means that every man and woman can trace their ancestry, their physical ancestry, their physical traits back to Adam and Eve. I will quote again because it's appropriate here and for sake of emphasis, as Paul said, and he, God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, Acts 17, verse 26. Of course, we know from the study of the scriptures that many of Adam and Eve's children sinned against God. In time when the world had become so very, very wicked, and God decided to destroy the world by a great flood. One man, Noah, Genesis 6, 8, found grace in God's sight because he was faithful to God out of all other human beings. So Noah, Ms. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their sons and their wives, were the ones that entered the ark. That ark was built according to God's directions, by God's authority. And they did not deviate from it. Genesis, Genesis 6.22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Would that that could be put upon all tombstones marking the graves of people as to the way they lived their life while they were on earth. So when God destroyed the world of Noah and his family, saving them, to repopulate the world. Genetically, all of us come from them. We trace our lineage back to Noah. And of course, the genetic properties that Adam and Eve had, so did Noah. And of course, that has to do with his sons. Now, the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three then were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Genesis 9, verses 18 through 19. Remember the word Genesis means origins. You expect to find origins of things, beginning of things there. And if you go from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, or if you go to that, you will see that it records the origin of our various ethnicities and languages among all humankind. Well, after the flood, mankind violated God's command. That is typical of man. He never does stay very long faithful servants of God. They begin to fill the earth. They try to stay in one particular area. God didn't want them to do that, but that's where they're staying. They all speak the same language. They're not a diversity of languages. There's just one language. So they begin a building project. They intend by building that tower of Babel to make a name for themselves. Man's always liked to glorify himself. He likes his viewpoint of things more than he likes anybody else's. And when it comes down to all of us among ourselves, each one likes to have his own way. 
being a Christian teaches you not to do that. And so we sing a song sometimes concerning God's will being done in our life. Let him have his way with thee. Well, that's easy said. It's not so easy done. But when you become a Christian, you're saying, whatever God's will is for my life, that I'm going to do. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Command, and I will obey. The society may say this. The culture may say this. Your family may teach this. Your ethnicity may be dominated by a certain thing. Well, are we willing to let God have his way with us as taught in the authoritative word of God? Listen, and they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the, will reach the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11 and verse 4. Of course, God stopped the project and did it very simply. He just altered their languages so they could not communicate with one another. I don't know how much you may have been around people where you could not speak their language, they could not speak yours. But it pretty well shuts down any kind of social interaction of any kind. So because communication was impossible, then those who spoke the same language out of that whole group of people all partied up together and they went different directions. And so the world began to be populated. Genesis chapter 10 records the various nations that resulted from their dispersion. People sometimes wonder how we can gain such a diverse set of looks, appearances, body shapes, and so on from one single solitary set of parents. It's not hard. The answer is found in genetics. In the great wisdom of God, in Adam and Eve, we put all of the genetic information that would be needed to bring about all of these different peoples that are on the earth today. Since our genes are made up of pairs, the simple explanation is that Adam and Eve would have a blend of every possible pair. Isn't that amazing? Nowadays in modern science, there's been a whole lot discovered about genetics that just a few years ago we didn't know, and it seems to be the area, and especially medical science, that's just tremendous as far as the possibilities when it comes to curing illnesses. But be that as it may, God put it there in the beginning in Adam and Eve. In the scientific terms that have not existed but in recent years, of what we know as science. Heterozygous is the way that that's referred to, heterozygous. From them, they would have had children of a wide variety of colors and characteristics. We don't think about that much when we're reading about all the children, but they had a lot of children. We won't take time to go back and read it because they lived a long, long time, and the scripture says, as they were commanded, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And they did. You know, when I was back in high school, I took agriculture for three years. I think it was probably the most profitable practical study I ever had. You don't hear much about it anymore. People too city-fied, they don't want to be known as an agri boy or FFA or Future Farmers of America. But we studied. We took time to study genetics. <laughs> And they showed us how to take genes and match them all up and draw all these figures that come out with just how many would have dominant and recessive genes. And just in one pair of rabbits, say a black rabbit, a white rabbit, what all you would get from pairing them up. So it's amazing. And great work was done back in the 19th century when this first began to be dabbed into when it came to breeding fruit flies. They had such a short period of life that they could breed them and see down through successive generations over a year's time, many, many generations, and see the changes in all of them. Well, as, as people, families, began to be isolated, and that was due to the language barrier, there were certain characteristics that became dominant in each family. 
I remember reading something back when I was in college that the sociologists and anthropologists had done in a study in a certain area of France back when France would have been what was called the Roman days, Gaul, all of them were pagans. And they were different tribes, all sorts of tribes throughout, throughout France. And you had various superstitions, and they lived by those. Well, they found that one tribe believed that small earlobes was what ought to be. It was really the way you ought to look. And so they magnified small earlobes, and they got rid of people with big earlobes. But they found that other tribes in other places in France like big earlobes. You say, well, that sounds strange to me. Well, we're human beings. It's all strange when we leave it to ourselves, every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. But that became a dominant strain with whichever one you were in. And it begins to show up. You know, when you begin to, when you begin to develop a breed of animal, then you pick what you want out of the parents of that animal. Then it has a calf or colt or whatever. And you continue to breed that animal according to what you get. So many of the breed of dogs today haven't been around hardly 500 years because they bred them from one basic strain of dogs. Well, you can do that with human beings. And they didn't necessarily set about to do that kind of thing, but guess what? They found out that if you're a French person, and your heritage is there in France, and you have these big earlobes, they know pretty much what part of France you came from originally. Well, that's just one particular matter. Today we label variations and I say today because I said it was already, we don't find it in the Bible. We, we note those variations as races. But speaking biblically, in reality, they are characteristics caused by regional inbreeding. Different ethnicities. That's important to understand. Where did it all come from? Adam and Eve through Noah and his three sons. So whatever color skin Adam and Eve had, and nobody knows. Whatever color of hair they had, color of eyes, physical shape. In their DNA was the genetic possibilities extant today of whatever may develop in the future. Now I read back in the 1990s with the influx in fact, it's quite a lengthy, I think I still have the article. I kept it because it was so interesting that with the influx in America, since we're all a bunch of immigrants, different waves of immigrants come. And since about 1990 and 1980, especially 1990 on up, we've had a host of people coming to this country that were not like many before, who were basically Caucasian. And they've already and had then done a computer mock-up, or whatever you call it, of the way people are going to look 100 to 200 years from now when they all intermingle. How they're going to look different from a lot today. Well, you know, that's not going to change the human being, how one sins, what's right or wrong. It's not going to change the gospel. It's not going to change what the church is. It's not going to change what Christian living is. It's set out in the word of God. Think of Jesus for a minute. What do you think he looked like? Physically, of course. He was an Israelite. He was Semitic. So he wouldn't have necessarily looked like what we think Caucasians look like or even others. I would think he would have had a skin color that reflected that type of ethnicity. But let's face it, it really doesn't matter what the skin color is of any of our ancestors. 
because, God, because to God we're all one. For God so loved the world. I think that covers every person, every human being, that he gave his only begotten son. And in Acts 10, 35, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted of him. Now, we who are Christians, we who are converted to Christ, we who are striving to live like the New Testament teaches, we're going to take that viewpoint. If we don't, we're not thinking like we ought to think. We're not letting the Word of God dwell in us richly to form our viewpoints and attitudes. In the Lord's church, we're all offered the same hope of salvation. Paul put it this way, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, no slaves. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. Now he's not talking about that there are not duties, roles, if you want to call it that, that God has assigned to females and to males. He just means as far as being saved from your sins and living faithful in the church so heaven will be your home. There's no difference. The women here obey the gospel, obey the same gospel I've obeyed, have the same Bible I have, worship the same way, and so on. But we have guidelines when it comes to the family. The family, you're taught that the man is the head of the house. Now, people are today kicking out biblical marriage or marriage of any kind, and they're not liking the idea of what God said about the home, but let me tell you something, that originated in the mind of God and is revealed in the Bible, also in Genesis and repeated again in Matthew 19 for the way God wants it. But the same truth governs all. You take a congregation and its organization, when it's fully organized, you have elders and deacons and preachers and teachers. Well, each one has different responsibilities. Some overlap, that's true. But there's the elder's qualifications that person must meet, but it doesn't change him being a brother in Christ. Same thing of deacons, preachers, or preachers who serve as elders. It doesn't change, but it's all from the Word of God. The apostles of Christ had a station and office that was different from other people. So we're not talking about that kind of thing, but it's the same Word of God that assigns us in every way that guides us in every way, that is our final authority in knowing what's right and wrong in morals and spiritual things. So what we see in Galatians 3.28 is the promise of the new covenant. The people from every nation would flow into the church, the kingdom, the body of Christ. That had been forecast long years before during the Babylonian captivity Daniel 7 and verse 14, Then to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom. That's talking about before it ever happened, when Christ, after his resurrection, returned to heaven. That all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. All peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. Daniel 7 and 14. That was all in the divine mind of God, and down through hundreds of years and hundreds of years, God revealed it gradually throughout the Old Testament to the time we get to the fullness of time, the exact time in God's wisdom to bring Christ into the world and to do what he did that the New Testament reveals. The gospel is preached to those who dwell on the earth. Watch it. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Revelation 14, 6. Last book of the Bible. And John's vision of heaven, John's vision given by God to him, the apostle John, was one of a great multitude which no one could number, now listen, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands, Revelation 7, 9. Thus the gospel, as I said a while ago, is to be taught to everybody because it is God's power to save. 
God's power to save is found nowhere else but in the glad tidings of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And thus in Matthew's account, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, of the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples or teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you all the way, even in the end of the age. So the truth is the truth is the truth, regardless of the color of your skin, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of the nation from which you are from, regardless of the culture that you have. The truth of the gospel is for everyone, and it doesn't change. It must not be corrupted, Galatians chapter 1. No one's to be excluded. For one nationality to place itself above any other would be sinful. As God is no respecter of people, neither can his people be. So rather than seeking to divide, it's our desire as Christians, Christians, that means of Christ, we must seek to fulfill Christ's dream of becoming one. We often refer to the oneness of the teaching of the New Testament, or the teaching of the oneness of God's people, the unity of God's people, and we think of proper worship and all other things. We think of oneness in that way, but it also has oneness to do an attitude one toward another, a state of mind, an outlook. I do not, and you do not, have to like every way that a person does something. But that doesn't mean you spurn them. You reject them. Sin is the only thing that separates a person from God. Jesus, we can say it this way, God through Jesus by the gospel solved the sin problem. Sin's a transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Nothing else can keep you out of heaven other than unforgiven sins. Nothing. Now, there are a lot of things in different cultures that I don't like. I've been in the Far East. I often said in my travels that I would try anything to eat that I thought was being prepared right and cooked right. But I, I never was able to get an appetite to eat snakes. I know even in America, we have rattlesnake cooking and all that stuff. Maybe very good. I like that. You can eat it all you want to. All other things being scripturally equal, that doesn't make you sin. I like it. Bugs. I tried grasshoppers one time. Tastes like what I had burnt popcorn <laughs> I don't think I ever took more than a bite or two I don't like that now you may live off of it John the baptizer the forerunner of the Christ ate locusts and wild honey that's grasshoppers folks I don't know that we in our modern days would be too buddy buddy with John the baptizer don't know that he smelled very good and I've been in some countries to where they don't use deodorant like we do. And I can tell you some specific situations that made me had to turn around the other direction and whatever. But overall, is that sin against God? Wonder what kind of deodorant Abraham used. And he's the father of the faithful. And so on and so forth. We, therefore, in studying the Bible and right, dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, and seeking authority from our Lord in the words of the Bible to know how to live our lives, must understand the difference in likes and dislikes and in what is actual sin. Today, and we must deal with it because it's around us, Many define racism to be something entirely different the way we've been studying the Bible. In fact, some of those who are espousing it do not realize they're coming 
from a philosophy that's totally foreign to the Bible. Let me read you this. We are guided, and this is a quote, we are guided by the fact that all black lives matter, regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, economic status, ability, disability, religious beliefs or disbeliefs, immigration, status, or location. Now, when somebody tells me all black lives matter, I can certainly, if you let me define that right, say you're exactly right. But I want them to tell me more about what that means. Because I would say all lives matter. Then I read further. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. Whoops, that's beginning to cause me to wonder. We are self-reflective and do the work required to dismantle ice gender privilege and uplift black trans folk especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. You see, that's moved away from your ethnicity and the color of your skin. That statement is moved over into matters of morals now. What's well, right or wrong? My Bible and your Bible tells you that God made humankind male and female, period. I don't care whether your skin's black, copper, white, maybe even be purple. I don't know. That makes no difference to me. Humankind is male and female. Now, what's happened over the years is that people have brought matters of morality and put it into the area of rights, and they've ruined the whole thing. I read again from what we believe Black Lives Matter. We foster a queer-affirming network. Now, I didn't use that term on my own. They did. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. You think that some of these people who wrote this or whoever wrote it should be caused to define their terms so I know what they mean? People can take things that basically are good and turn it into a mess. It's been done with Christianity. Most of what people know as Christianity is corrupted Christianity. It's not like the New Testament lays it out. And we have begged for years to return to the Bible, to call Bible things by Bible names, do Bible things in Bible ways, have the authority of Christ as manifested His rightly divided word, and let's all be what we ought to be. Well, you can do that with morals. The Bible sets the standard. But you don't do it by arraying one bunch of people against another. I don't care what color your skin is. This group declares support for homosexuality, and other deviations from sex only being allowed in a marriage between a man and a woman. Marriage and the bed is undefiled. Whoremongers, adulterers, God will judge. Now you can call that whatever you want to call it, but that's what God calls it, and it'll read mean the same day on the day of judgment as it does right now. We must separate the difference between morality and ethnic conduct as taught in the scriptures. And what has to do with just simply the difference in ethnicity, difference in the way we're made physically. Now, I know what I read to you today is popular in the secular world, and even among some who name themselves Christians who are ignorant of the Bible. Remember, God said of Israel of old, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So Christians, as the Bible defines Christians, not as the world does, as that term is used in the scriptures, recognize that these things run contrary to the teachings of the Bible. I simply ask you, and I think nowadays if you keep up with anything, you know what's being said and popularized about homosexuality and transgenderism and all that stuff. Well, it doesn't make any difference about what people say about it. I preach the word. 
every faithful, and all the word faithful means, seeing that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17, and we're walked by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We preach the word, whether it has to do with the plan of salvation or the church, its work, its organization, its worship, individual Christian living, and in the area of individual Christian living we're dealing with now, then God addresses these matters. Notice that they oppose biblical marriage. Well, that's been going on before it ever got into this situation I just read to you a moment ago. People have been winking at marriage, kicking it out, ignoring it, and in this country it's all around. They don't want God to have the final say as to who, who is qualified to marry. They don't want God to have the final say about a husband and a wife and their roles and so on. Well, I can't help it. If I'm a Christian, I preach the truth, I defend the faith, I deal with these matters, regardless of what anybody thinks of me. One of the best things you can do if you're going to be faithful to your God is to cease caring about what people think about you because you live right, you preach right, and you defend the right. I don't care what color you are or what ethnicity you are. That's just the way it is. Now, you say, where do you get that attitude? Have you ever read the New Testament? Have you ever read the book of Acts? Have you ever read what the church did in the first century to preach the gospel? Have you ever read about the persecution they brought on themselves? You remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Did Stephen really have to say those things? Yeah, he did. Stephen was a Greek Jew. Stephen's a Greek name. He was one of those that was selected to take care of the widows who were being neglected in the daily ministration. Says he went to the synagogue of the freedmen. It says in the American Standard that libertines are, are those that were considered free. They were, they were Jews who were raised outside of Palestine, and so they had their own synagogue because they felt comfortable with one another. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Oh, it doesn't violate God's will. So he went to teach his own people because he loved them enough, and he carries them through the long history of how Israel came into being. But then he gets down to the prophets, and he points out, you, you, like those people of old, have killed the prophets. And then he lays it on the line to them about the caliber person they were because they took and killed the Christ. Made them, as we would say today, mad as a hornet, and did some. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They took him out and killed him. Somebody could say, well, he didn't have to say that. He could have kept quiet. He could have. Folks, listen, there's only so far you can go. And when it comes to the truth, individually speaking to your neighbor or whoever you are, or speaking to a group like this or larger, you must preach the truth in love. Now, many people read preach the truth in love, and they think about loving the person you're preaching it to. Well, of course you love them. God loved them, but he won't save them apart from the truth. You give me most kindly affection toward people and love your family. But that will lead you to teach them the truth. It will lead, lead you to show them the way of righteousness no matter how much it disrupts their lifestyle, how much it goes against their culture, if their culture is such that it's going contrary to the truth. Notice what else is said on what we believe in Black Lives Matter. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages, in quotes, that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. Do you realize what they're saying? The family unit doesn't make any difference anymore. Well, it didn't have to get to Black Lives Matter view of things before that was happening. I worked in child care many years ago, and I saw firsthand over and over every day I went to work of what happens when families fall apart for whatever reason, and the children are left on their own. If you want to see this nation change, it'll be when each one begins to embrace the truth of God when people will obey God and when people will follow the teaching of God's good word on marriage and the family and the responsibilities of husbands and wives, mothers and daddies and so on. 
But people who are void of the truth, who have sold themselves out, are being told that Christianity is it's Western religion anyway. No. You know one of the things we used to do went to Russia? Because Russia is considered East. You may not realize that, but it's considered East. One of the things we would say, because we were Americans, and we were in there not long after communism ended, and I would stand up before a group this big and a whole lot larger at times, and I'd say, I'm coming to you not with a religion from America. It did not originate in America. It originated in the East where you are. Mesopotamian, Palestine. I'm preaching to you what was brought to me and did not originate with me. I'm preaching to you the word of God for those people that wrote the Bible were not Americans. They were not Europeans. They were inspired of the Holy Spirit, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, so that this book is not a man-made book. It is God's book, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. It's God's word. And thus, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears, and shall be turned away from the truth unto fables. Well, that doesn't just cover the plan of salvation or the church, its work, its organization, its worship. It covers everything pertaining to what the Bible teaches that God demands of man, including what marriage is and who may marry. And the duties of husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. God addresses those things. And it therefore addresses all people regardless of their ethnicity and color as to their responsibility to God. Solomon warns, be not thy envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. For their hearts studieth destruction and their lips talk of mischief. Proverbs 24, 1 and 2. Even in the first centuries the New Testament was being written, Paul addressed Timothy saying, here's something you need to know, Timothy. This know also, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, heady, high-minded, despisers of those that are good, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What is your attitude, Timothy? Paul says, from such turn away. Don't let them influence you. Don't believe them. You have the Bible. You can compare and contrast whatever you're taught with God's truth. That's why it's here. And thus, everything that comes our way, I don't care whether it comes from society, Austin, Texas, Washington, D.C., wherever it's coming, if it does not compare favorably with the Word of God, reject it. Well, yeah, but my uncle has 19 PhDs from Harvard and Yale, Oxford, and all the rest of them. I don't care what he's got. If it's contrary to the truth, Reject it. Yeah, but the government said this, the government said that, and the United Nations said we ought to do this way, so I do not care. Yeah, if that may get you into trouble. I haven't seen any nail scars in my hands yet, and I haven't worn a crown of thorns for my Lord. But I do know Revelation 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and you'll receive a crown of life. That's my duty. Take up my cross daily and follow him. Regardless of what anybody thinks of me, my brethren, my family, whatever it is, I have to do what's right. Now listen, we'll close here. Here's why. Jesus said, he who died for me, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken thee, same shall judge him in the last day. It won't be the Supreme Court. It won't be any human court. Supreme or otherwise. It won't be my mother or daddy, brother or sister or my best friends. It won't even be my brethren in the church. They'll all be in line with me before the judgment bar of Christ. 
where I will give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And the standard of judgment for us today in this Christian dispensation is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. So I must adopt the truth of God into my thinking and into my life, or I will never be in heaven with God. Fairness and equality are ideals that Christians promote when it's taught by the truth. But groups that claim to be so good for us and teach contrary to the, proof, uh, to the truth of the Bible are not. They're the devil's crowd. I don't care who they're pretending to uphold. If you're not a Christian today, the plan of salvation is clear. One must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You must repent of your sins, Acts 17 and 30. He commanded the fallen men everywhere to repent. You must confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10. And to complete your obedience to the gospel to become a Christian, you must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38, Matthew 28.18, verses following. 1 Peter 3.21, verses 6, chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Romans, and so many others. You must do that. I can't lower the standard. I don't care what your, if your ethnicity won't let you believe that, you will be lost. Or any other thing that hinders you from believing and obeying the truth. As a child of God, if you sin, you must repent of sins, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness. There's oneness to be found in this world. It's when we all decide to submit to the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our King, absolute monarch, whose word is law, Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.